أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad for the past few episodes we've been discussing the Mi'raj of the Prophet. Because the Mi'raj uh, took place either in the beginning or the middle of the Meccan period, uh, and because it was such a, a transformative uh, experience for the Prophet, I felt that it was important to dedicate uh, a few sessions, a few episodes uh, to the Isra and the Mi'raj. Uh, before we begin, uh, before we continue uh, with the narrations, that detail the Prophet's uh, uh, Mi'raj. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, which again highlights the theological importance of the ascension of the Prophet, of the Mi'raj of the Prophet. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is reported to have said, مَنْ أَنْكَرَ ثَلَاثَةَ أَشْيَاءٍ فَلَيْسَ مِنْ شِيَعَتِنَا Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says that whoever denies, whoever rejects three things is not from our followers. Meaning that these three things are considered uh, among the fundamental beliefs of Shia Islam. The Imam says al-mi'raj, to believe in the mi'raj of the Prophet. Now again, we might have disagreements about the minute details, but the ascension itself, to believe in the ascension, ascension itself, is uh, one of the, uh, the principles and the tenets of faith. Number one is the mi'raj. وَالْمُسَاءَلَةَ فِي الْقَبْرِ And the questioning in the grave. We have many ahadith that speak about uh, how the angels will question people about their beliefs and about their deeds, about how they live their lives in the grave. So the questioning in the grave was shafa'a and intercession. So again, one of the three that the Imam السلام, mentions is the mi'raj, which again speaks to uh, the importance of this event in the life of the Prophet. Continuing the tradition, the narration of the Mi'raj, and we're drawing primarily from uh, volume 18 of Bihar al-Anwar. In our last episode, we left off uh, at the seventh heaven where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encounters, he meets Prophet Ibrahim. They exchange uh, pleasantries, they greet each other, they pray for each other. And of course, in the previous heavens, the Prophet uh, he met and he interacted with with uh, with previous prophets. Here, the prophet uh, narrates, "Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa ra'aytu fi al-sama' al-sabi'a." Now, the prophet is uh, recounting what he witnessed in the seventh heaven, which is beyond uh, the the station of of Ibrahim السلام. So now he's traversing and journeying further into uh, the seventh heaven. وَرَأَيْتُ فِي السَّمَاءِ السَّابِعَةِ بِحَارًا مِنْ نُورٍ يَتَلَأْلَأُ تَلَأْلُؤُهَا يَخْطَفُ بِالْأَبْصَارِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that I saw in the seventh heaven oceans of glimmering light and this light was so intense that it almost blinded me it almost it, it could snatch away a person's eyesight oceans and oceans of dazzling light the prophet says i also saw oceans of darkness وَبِحَارٌ مِنْ ثَلْجٍ تَرْعُدٍ And I saw oceans of ice. Now, of course, the Prophet is not speaking about literal ice, but 
these are this is the closest thing, the closest word that the Prophet uh, can use to describe what he's witnessing. Oceans of ice and uh, and thunder. And here, interestingly, the Prophet says, "Fakullama fazirt." You can only imagine, you know, how overwhelming that must have been, how completely uh, bewildered a person is when they see, when they witness such scenes. "Fakullama fazirt," wa The Prophet says, "Whenever I was stunned by what I was witnessing." I would ask Jibra'il about it. فَقَالَ أَبْشُرْ يَا مُحَمَّدِ وَاشْكُرْ كَرَامَةَ رَبِّكِ وَاشْكُرِ اللَّهَ بِمَا صَنَعَ إِلَيْكِ Jibra'il would always tell the Prophet, whenever Jibra'il saw that the Prophet was stunned and he would ask questions about what he was witnessing, Jibra'il says to the Prophet, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ O Muhammad, be glad, you know, be happy. Be thankful to Allah for this honor because you are witnessing ayat, you are witnessing signs of Allah's greatness, of His majesty that no one before you has ever witnessed. You are, you are experience something, experiencing something that is so unique that no one else is tasting the pleasure and the delights, the spiritual delights that you are experiencing. قَالَ فَثَبَّتَنِيَ اللَّهُ بِقُوَّتِهِ وَعَوْنِ The Prophet said, Allah strengthened me. He made me firm with His strength and with His help. And this you know, could be a, uh, an indication that if any, any other person were to have witnessed what the Prophet was witnessing, they would have perished. Meaning that the Prophet needed this extra divine support and help to withstand the scenes of the, the seventh heaven. Because there are certain, I mean, Musa in the Quran, Allah tells us that Musa fainted when Allah made, when he manifested his glory to that mountain. You know, Sometimes people faint when they experience earthly phenomenons. Here the Prophet is experiencing the signs and the phenomenons of the seventh heaven. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally is going to fortify his heart so that he has the capacity to, uh, to experience and to witness those, uh, those creations and those signs. And then the, the angel Jibra'il notices that the Prophet is continuously mesmerized by what he is witnessing. So much so that Jibra'il says to the Prophet, Ya Muhammad, tu'azzimu ma tara. إِنَّمَا هَذَا خَلْقٌ مِّنْ خَلْقِ رَبِّكِ فَكَيْفَ بِالْخَالِقِ الَّذِي خَلَقَ مَا تَرَى Jibra'il says to the Prophet that, O oh Muhammad, you are bedazzled by, you consider what you are seeing to be great and mesmerizing. But remember that what you are seeing is a creation from among the creations of your Lord. Consider the greatness of the one who created what you are seeing. And then Jibra'il says, وَمَا لَا تَرَى أَعْظَمُ مِنْ هَذَا مِنْ خَلْقِ رَبِّكِ That, O oh Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, what you have not yet seen is even greater than what you have seen. And then Jibra'il reveals to the Prophet أَنَّ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَبَيْنَ خَلْقِهِ تِسْعِينَ أَلْفَ حِجَابٍ That, O Muhammad, 
Verily, between God and His creatures is 90,000 veils. Again, this, not, this might not be a literal number, but it's, it's, it alludes to the idea that there are many veils, there are many degrees of separation between God and His creatures, meaning separation in terms of their ability to comprehend Him, the ability to encompass His greatness, the ability to grasp His essence. وَأَقْرَبُ الْخَلْقِ إِلَى اللَّهِ And the closest of creations to God, at least among the angels, because we know that the Prophet ﷺ is the closest creation to God. Jibra'il says, وَأَقْرَبُ الْخَلْقِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنَا وَإِسْرَافِيلِ And the closest creations to God are Israfil, the angel who uh, will blow the the horn or the trumpet, which will cause the annihilation of all of creation of the heavens and the earth. And with the second blowing of the trumpet, everything will be revived uh, for the resurrection. Jibra'il says that me and Israfil are the closest creations to Allah. And but between us and Allah are four veils. So we are the closest. But even us, there are four veils between us and Allah. حجاب من نور وحجاب من ظلمة وحجاب من الغمام وحجاب من الماء A veil of light, a veil of darkness, a veil of clouds, and a veil of water. What does this mean? What is this in reference to? We don't know. And anyone who claims to know, unless they are uh, basing their uh, views on the words of the ma'asumin, is, is presenting pure uh, conjecture. And then the narration continues, ثُمَّ مَضَيْتُ مَعَ جِبْرَائِيلِ I continued with Jibra'il, فَدَخَلْتُ الْبَيْتَ الْمَعْمُورِ Until we entered Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur is essentially the Kaaba, the Qibla of, for the inhabitants of the heavens. And this is where uh, Ibrahim a.s. was stationed. فَصَلَّيْتُ فِيهَا رَكَعَتَيْنِ The Prophet says, I prayed in Bayt Al-Ma'mur, and with me there were a group of my companions. Now this could be a reference to some of the companions of the Prophet who had already passed away and the Prophet was seeing their barzakhi uh, forms. Or it could be a, a vision of the future. عَلَيْهِمْ ثِيَابٌ جُدُدْ وَآخَرِينَ عَلَيْهِمْ ثِيَابٌ خُلْقَانٌ some of my companions had new clothing and others had older clothing but they were still you know in that in that realm فَدَخَلَ أَصْحَابُ الْجُدُدْ وَحُبِصَ أَصْحَابُ الْخُلْقَانِ Those companions who were wearing new clothing they entered into الْبَيْتُ الْمَعْمُورِ with me but those who did not they were not uh, they were not able to enter so again, this shows us that among the companions of the Prophet, there are various degrees. There are some who are not pious. Some of them are, you know, hypocrites, as the Quran mentions, and others are pious. And even among the pious, there are various uh, ranks of uh, and degrees of excellence. Then the Prophet leaves Al Baytul Ma'mur, and the narration says, ثُمَّ خَرَجْتُ فَانْقَادَ لِي نَهَرَانِ I then left and I came across two rivers. نَهَرٌ يُسَمَّ الْكَوْثَرُ وَنَهَرٌ يُسَمَّ الْرَحْمَةِ Two rivers. One of them was called Al-Kawthar and the other was called the River of Rahma, which is which means mercy. فَشَرِبْتُ مِنَ الْكَوْثَرِ I drank from the river of Kothar, and I bathed in the river of Rahma. 
ثُمَّنْ قَادَ لِي جَمِيعًا حَتَّى دَخَلْتُ الْجِنَّةِ And this was all preparation for me to enter paradise. So the Prophet goes through the samawat and now he is entering Jannah. Perhaps the barzakh Jannah or the Prophet is having visions of the, the Jannah which will exist uh, after uh, which the believers will enter after, their, uh, after the Day of Judgment. وَإِذَا عَلَىٰ حَافَتَيْهَا بُيُوتِ وَبُيُوتُ أَهْلِي The Prophet says that on the boundaries of paradise, I saw my homes. The Prophet ﷺ has many homes in paradise. There are people that have many homes in dunya. We ask Allah that we have more homes in paradise. وَبُيُوتُ أَهْلِي And the homes and of my, the residences of my family. وَإِذَا تُرَابُهَا كَالْمِسْكِ The Prophet mentions that the soil, the ground, the soil of Jannah smelled of musk. For those of you who've smelled musk, it's one of the most beautiful scents. Rasulullah says the dirt, the soil of Jannah smelled like musk. وَإِذَا جَارِيَةٌ تَنْغَمِسُ فِي أَنْهَارِ الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet said, I saw a, a servant, a, a, a maid, bathing in the rivers of paradise, a female maid. So the Prophet asks, who is this, uh, this maid? Who does she belong to? فقالت, so the Prophet asks the maid, you know, who do you belong to? The Prophet must have seen some signs that she was a servant or a maid. So the Prophet asked, who do you belong to? And she said, لزيد ibn ibn Haritha, the Prophet's, uh, uh, the Prophet's adopted, uh, adopted son. لزيد ibn Haritha. And Zayd ibn Haritha was still alive. So this was uh, a vision of what he was uh, to receive. فَبَشَّرْتُهُ بِهَا حِينَ أَصْبَحْتُ So the Prophet says, I told him about, uh, about this uh, when I returned from uh, the Mi'raj. وَإِذَا بِطَيْرِهَا كَالْبُخْتُ The Prophet then describes the, the birds of paradise. And he says that the birds of paradise were like, they were كَالْبُخْتُ بُخْت are are specific types of camels that were native to Khurasan, which is a city in Iran. And they're known for their, for their large size, for being robust uh, camels. So the Prophet is saying that the birds of paradise were large. وَإِذَا رُمَّانُهَا مِثْلُ الدُّلِيِّ الْعِظَامِ The pomegranates of paradise were massive in size. وَإِذَا شَجَرَةٌ لَوْ أُرْسِلَ طَائِرٌ فِي أَصْلِهَا مَا دَارَهَا سَبْعْمِئَةِ سَنَةٍ وَلَيْسَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ مَنْزِلٌ إِلَّا وَفِيهَا قُتُرٌ مِّنْهَا The Prophet says, I, I then saw a tree, a tree that was so massive that if a bird were to fly around the tree, just to make one orbit around that tree. Rasulullah says it would take it 700 years just to fly around this tree. And there is no house in Jannah in which one of the branches of this tree does not cover, meaning that this tree casts shade on every single house in paradise. فَقُلْتُ مَا هَذِهِ يَا جِبْرَائِيلِ The Prophet said, What is this, O Jibra'il? فَقَالَ هَذِهِ شَجَرَةُ طُوبَى This is the tree of طُوبَى which is mentioned in the, in the Qur'an. قَالَ اللَّهُ طُوبَى لَهُمْ وَحُسْنُ مَآبٍ 
Tuba shall be theirs. And the word Tuba also can uh, mean, you know, uh, good fortune or it's, a, it's an expression of glad tidings. But one of the meanings is that Tuba is uh, the name of one of the trees of paradise. And this is what is being uh, described. Now, parenthetically, I just wanted to mention this, uh, this narration because it comes up in other riwayat where the Prophet uh, speaks about what he saw in paradise. And this you know, has a very practical uh, lesson for us. We mentioned that the Prophet, according to Imam Sadiq, went on more than 100 ascensions. And one of, one of the narrations mentions the following. The Prophet says, لَمَّا أُسْرِيَ بِي إِلَى السَّمَاءِ دَخَلْتُ الْجَنَّةِ When I ascended uh, to the heavens, I was made to enter paradise. فَرَأَيْتُ فِيهَا قِيَعَانًا وَرَأَيْتُ فِيهَا مَلَائِكَةً يَبْنُونَ لَبِنَةً مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَلَبِنَةً مِنْ فِضَّةٍ The Prophet says, I entered Jannah and I saw that there were angels who were acting as construction workers. And they were placing, they were building structures. They were building using gold and silver bricks. And they would lay bricks and suddenly they would stop. They would work, work diligently, and then suddenly they would stop. And then they would continue, then suddenly they would stop. وَرُبَّمَا أَمْسَكُوا فَقُلْتُ لَهُمْ مَا بَالُكُمْ قَدْ أَمْسَكْتُمْ So the Prophet would ask, why is it that you suddenly stop working? I see that you work very diligently, you put in so much effort, and then you come to an abrupt stop. What is the reason? Why do you halt? Why do you come to this abrupt stop? فَقَالُوا حَتَّى تَجِيءَنَا النَّفَقَ They say we stop because we are waiting for the raw materials to be sent. So the Prophet ﷺ, he asks them, وَمَا نَفَقَتُكُمْ where, where do you get these raw materials from? How are they delivered to you? They say, قَالُوا قَوْلُ الْمُؤْمِنِ When a believer says, SubhanAllah, Glory be to Allah, وَالْحَمْدُلِلَّهِ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ There is no God. Glory be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. There is no God but Allah. And Allah is the greatest. فَإِذَا قَالَ If a mu'min utters these words of tasbih, فَإِذَا قَالَ بَنَيْنَا when, when he utters these words of tasbih, we build, we work. وَإِذَا سَكَتَ أَمْسَكْنَا But the moment that he stops engaging in the remembrance of Allah, we also stop. So this shows us, brothers and sisters, you know, one practical lesson that we learn is how valuable our time is. You know, sometimes we sit idly and we do nothing, and we're wasting these precious moments. We are we are depriving ourselves from the raw materials that uh, that could potentially construct this wondrous world for us. Uh, in paradise. And then, so going back to the the narration of the Mi'raj, when tahaytu ila sidrat al muntaha, the Prophet continued on his journey until he reached sidrat al muntaha. And so this is, you know, now the discussion of paradise is uh, is completed, and the Prophet journeys to. Sidratul Munta. Sidratul Munta, the translation seems to be the the lot tree. You know, Sidr is uh, is lot the lot tree of the the furthest boundary, the furthest boundary of the seventh heaven. So this is where you know Jibrail is no law is now even Jibrail cannot accompany uh, 
the uh, the prophet and this is why the prophet says when tahaytu ila sidratil munta there's jibrail is is not with the prophet anymore even jibrail when the prophet asks you know are you going to continue with me on this journey and jibrail says that i if i advance even an inch i will i will burn meaning that i this is my limit i cannot go beyond uh, this boundary. So the Prophet then enters into a realm which no other creature before him nor after him will ever enter. And he, he enters into a state of intense proximity to Allah. And this is where the Prophet experiences a sort of unveiling where the veils, whatever veils were there, whatever veils could be removed, were removed. And the, and the Prophet experiences a closeness to Allah that no Prophet nor any angel had ever experienced. When tahaytu ila sidratil muntaha fa'idha al waraqatu minha tudillu ummatan min al umam. The Prophet says that this tree, the sidratul muntaha, is a tree that a single leaf of this tree could cover, could shade an entire nation. فَكُنْتُ مِنْهَا So I attained this state of nearness and Allah describes it as قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى as the, the measure of two bows or even closer. You know, this is an expression of uh, incredible proximity. And Allah reveals to the Prophet what He reveals and the ahadith are very lengthy in this regard. We don't have time to go into too much detail. But among the things that the Prophet says and among the things that Allah says to the Prophet is the following. فَنَادَانِي Allah announces to the Prophet. He calls on the Prophet saying, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ And this is in fact an ayah in the Qur'an. Allah says to the Prophet, the Prophet believes in that which his Lord has revealed to him. فَقُلْتُ So the Prophet then says, he says that I replied on my behalf and on behalf of my nation. Now, this is a very private, intimate moment between Allah and the Prophet. And of course, I'm using the word moment met metaphorically because this is, you know, we're, we're in a, this is, a place that is outside of the, 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 the realm of, of time and space. Only Allah and His Messenger know the reality of that encounter. But the Prophet says, فَقُلْتُ أَنَا مُجِيبًا عَنِّي وَعَنْ أُمَّتِي I, I replied on behalf of myself and my nation. You know, Even when the Prophet is in this position, when he's having this private, intimate encounter with his Lord, he is still mindful of his ummah. This shows you the, the merciful heart of the Prophet. He says, I responded on my behalf and on behalf of my ummah. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّن رُسُلِهِ So Allah begins by saying, the Prophet believes in that which his Lord has revealed to him. Rasulullah responds by saying, and the believers too. It's as if the Prophet is saying that, Oh Allah, recognize them. Even though their iman is not like my iman, include them, recognize them as believers too. They, have, they all believe in God and His angels and His books and His messengers. We do not differentiate between any of His messengers. فَقُلْتُ سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ Then I said, we hear and we obey. So the Prophet is speaking on his behalf and on behalf of all of those who believe in him, on behalf of his ummah. Our Lord, your forgiveness is what we yearn for, what we crave, and to you is the, the eventual uh, course. So you see that in the, that encounter, the Prophet makes it a point to place us in the ranks of those who believe and to seek forgiveness on our behalf. 
فقال الله لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها الله says God does not impose upon any soul a duty but to the extent of its ability لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت for it is the benefit of what it has earned and upon it the evil of what it has done so Allah again another manifestation of His rahmah, of His mercy, of His justice, is that Allah does not burden, He doesn't take people to account for the things that are beyond their ability. And then the Prophet says, and again, these are all ayat of the Qur'an, فَقُلْتُ رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَاخِذْنَا إِن نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا The Prophet says, and again, this dua of the Prophet, it becomes a verse of the Qur'an. Our Lord, Rabbana, la tu'akhidna in nasina aw akhta. Do not take us to account for the things that we forget and the th- and, and for our mistakes. Meaning, don't punish us for things that we forget. You know, for example, let's say hypothetically someone forgets to pray Salatul Fajr. They genuinely forgot. And, and let's say they never remember. They die thinking that they prayed Fajr, but they in fact forgot to pray it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to punish such a person. Why? Because He doesn't punish us for the things that we genuinely forget. For things that we do inadvertently, mistakes. You know, sometimes if you take an exam and you make a mistake, your professor, your teacher is still going to give you negative marks. You're going to get Mark down for it. It's going to affect your grade. But with Allah, the things that we do mistakenly, the mistakes, the genuine mistakes that we make, things that we forget, Allah doesn't take us to account. So the Prophet makes this dua. Do not take us to account for that which we forget and, and for our errors, for our mistakes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in response, لا أخذك, I will not take you to account. فقلت ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا. Oh Allah, do not burden us. Do not put on us a burden like the burdens that you put on those who came before us. You know, one of the things that was uh, expected of Bani Israel is that if a certain part of their body becomes mutanajis, they would have to remove the skin of that body part. But in the Sharia of the Prophet, we can purify our bodies through through water. You know, other Sharias in the past, the laws uh, pertaining to najasa and tahara were much more stringent. They were much more strict. So the Prophet is saying that do not put on us, do not lay on us burdens in the way that you laid on those who came before us. So Allah again responds to the dua of the Prophet, لا أحملك, I will not put a burden on you and uh, in the way that I put uh, a burden on those who came before you. And the Prophet then of course asks, you know, ربنا uh, ولا do not place on us responsibilities that we cannot bear, that are, that are too difficult for us. Pardon us, forgive us, have mercy upon us. So again, much of what the Prophet says during this encounter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is related to his ummah. It's related to alleviating the difficulties and the hardships from his ummah. And this is why Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, مَا وَفَدَ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَحَدٌ أَكْرَمُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ There is no one who has gone to God with a request with, with, with nobility like the Prophet did. No one more noble than the Prophet has ever entered into that 
uh, state with Allah, had an encounter with God where nearly everything that they ask is about, not for themselves, it's about their ummah, it's about their people. Among the things that the Prophet ﷺ requests, he says, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ يَا رَبِّ أَعْطَيْتَ أَنْبِيَاءَكَ فَضَائِلْ فَأَعْطِنِي O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, you have granted favors to your prophets. So grant me as well. فَأَعْطِنِي Give me as well. فَقَالَ اللَّهُ قَدْ أَعْطَيْتُكَ فِي مَا أَعْطَيْتُكَ كَلِمَتَيْنِ I will give you, in addition to everything else that I have given you, I will give you two supplications. من تحت عرشي, which is from under my throne, meaning this is a sign of the, the value and the preciousness of this dua. And it's a very short dua, it's two, two supplications, two expressions. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا منجا منك إلا إليك Very short and very simple. And it would be useful if we can memorize this and try to say it throughout the day or as much as we can. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله There is no power, there is no strength except with Allah. This is the first dua. ولا منجا منك إلا إليك and there is no refuge from you. You know, let's say someone wanted to escape God's punishment. You wanted to run away from God. There is no refuge from you except through you. Because Allah is He's the only one who is independent. Everything else relies on Him. And there is no refuge from you except through you. And I'll conclude with this, uh, even though this is not mentioned uh, in the specific narration that I'm quoting, we know that in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, salah will be legislated later on. But because prayer was legislated, and, and we'll speak about this again when we get to uh, the year in which uh, salah was legislated, uh, we know that the Prophet went on a number of ascensions and it was during the Mi'raj uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated uh, the five daily prayers. And as many of you know, the original obligation was 50 prayers a day. And we're familiar with the story of Musa, the intervention of Musa where he pleads with the Prophet and he intercedes on behalf of the Ummah that, you know, 50 is, is too, it's too burdensome, it's too difficult for people to, uh, uh, to implement. Ask Allah to reduce the number. Eventually, after going back and forth, the number is reduced from 50 daily prayers to 5 uh, daily prayers. There's a narration from uh, Zayd ibn Ali who is one of the sons of Imam Zainul Abidin, and he asks about this. And this is something that is related to the Mi'raj, and I, I thought it would be useful to conclude our episode with this, uh, this hadith. This hadith is mentioned in Kitab salah the book of prayer in Wasail al-Shia. Uh, typically, it's, uh, if you have the 10 volume set, it's, uh, it's volume 2, the book of prayer, and you'll find it, I believe it's the sixth uh, narration. Sa'al to Abi. Sayyid al Abidin. Zayd ibn Ali says, I asked my father, the master of worshippers, Imam Zainul al Abidin, فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَى Oh my dear father, أَخْبِرْنِ عَنْ جَدِّنَا رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Tell me about our grandfather, the messenger of God. لَمَّا عُرِجَ بِهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَأَمَرَهُ رَبُّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِخَمْسِينَ صَلَاةٍ كَيْفَ لَمْ يَسْأَلُهُ التَّخْفِيفَ عَنْ أُمَّتِهِ حَتَّى قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَى, موسى بْنُ عِمْرَانِ اِرْجِعِ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكْ فَسَلْهُ التَّخْفِيفِ فَإِنَّ أُمَّتَكَ لَا تُطِيقُ ذَلِكَ Zayd ibn Ali says to his father that when the Prophet ascended to the heavens, 
and Allah commanded him to pray, to offer 50 daily prayers, why didn't the Prophet ask Allah to reduce the number from 50 and to make it less? Why, why did Musa have to intervene? Because Musa argued that your ummah cannot take it. Was Musa more aware and more familiar with the capabilities of the people than the Prophet? So why, why didn't the Prophet himself request that the number be reduced? Imam Zain al-Abideen, he says, Ya Bunay, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلَى لَا يَقْتَرِحُ عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلَا يُرَاجِعُ فِي شَيْءٍ يَأْمُرُهُ بِهِ Imam Zain al-Abideen says, O oh my dear son, the Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah, does not make suggestions to his Lord because Rasulullah is the perfect abd. And, the, and, and a true servant, a perfect servant, does not make suggestions to his master. So on the one side, it is the perfection of the Prophet's ubudiyah that prevents him from making this suggestion. فَلَمَّا سَأَلَهُ مُوسَى ذَلِكَ Now when Musa asked the Prophet, to reduce the number, Musa was acting as an intercessor for the Ummah, on behalf of the Ummah, an intercessor to the Prophet on behalf of the Ummah. فَلَمَّا سَأَلَهُ مُوسَى ذَلِكَ وَصَارَ شَفِيعًا لِأُمَّتِي إِلَيْهِ لَمْ يَجُزْ لَهُ رَدَّ شَفَاعَةِ, شفاعة أَخِيهِ مُوسَى So the Prophet didn't ask Allah to reduce the number because the Prophet is a servant of God. And a servant never makes suggestions to his master. But when Musa presented himself as a shafi', as an intercessor for the ummah of the Prophet, the Prophet is also rahmatan lil alameen. The Prophet is a mercy to the worlds. The Prophet is too kind, too merciful to turn away and to reject the request of his brother Musa. فَرَجْعَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ فَسَأَلَهُ التَّخْفِيفِ So, the Prophet asked Allah to reduce it until it was lowered and reduced to five daily prayers. Then Zayd ibn Ali asks his father, Imam Zayn al-Abidin, فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَتِي فَلِمَ لَمْ يَرْجِعَ لَمْ يَرْجِعَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلَمْ يَسْأَلْهُ التَّخْفِيفِ مِنْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ وَقَدْ سَأَلَهُ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ يَرْجِعَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَيَسْأَلْهُ التَّخْفِيفِ Zayd ibn Ali says to his father that why, why did it stop at five? Why didn't the Prophet ask to reduce it even more? Because Musa asked to reduce it even more than five, to make it even less than five. Why didn't the Prophet except to go and ask Allah to make it less than five. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he says, Ya Bunay, arada an yahsala li ummatihi takhfif ma'a ajri khamsin salah. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he says, the reason why the Prophet did not accept the request of Musa to, to lower it beyond five is because Rasulullah wanted to receive a reduction but not lose out on the reward of praying 50 prayers a day. How? Imam Zayn al Abidin he says, because Allah in the Quran says, Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amthaliha. Whoever does a good deed, they are given 10 of its like. So, salah is a good deed. Salah is hasana. If you pray five times a day and Allah multiplies it by ten, how many prayers is that? It's fifty. So the number five 
offers us that concession, that reduction, but we don't miss out on the thawab of those 50 prayers. So this is a snapshot of some of the, uh, some of the important uh, things that the Prophet experienced uh, during the Mi'raj. Inshallah, in our next episode, we will uh, continue with uh, the events uh, in Mecca uh, leading up to the, uh, the total boycott of the early Muslims and ultimately uh, the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions from the holy city of Mecca to their new home, uh, Yathrib, which will eventually be called Medina to Rasul, and uh, and then later on it will be known as the city of Medina for short. Uh, thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Uh, I look forward to having you join me on future episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. Seven heavens. It sounded like in the, it was in the seventh heaven that companions were being allowed into or brought into heaven or not the actual Jannah. So, is it that so, seven? so the the seventh uh, the seventh heaven where the prophet spoke of uh, of some companions who were able to enter Baytul Ma'mur. That was not Jannah. That was still in the 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 Samawat. And that was a reference to uh, to Al Bayt Al Ma'mur. That was not uh, the uh, the par- That was not paradise. That could have been that could have been related or part of their Barzakhi uh, paradise, but that was not uh, uh, paradise itself. And uh, this is it that kind of understood that these uh, seven heavens were all independent from Jannah then. It seems that seems to be the case that uh, that they they're independent. So samawat are are separate from uh, from uh, from from jannah from paradise. Now it's, again, when we say separate, there there are two. Is there some interaction? Are they related in some way? We don't know, but there there's a distinction. Made between Jannah and uh, and Samawat, at least uh, from my understanding. So we can't say, for example, that you know Jannah is in this specific uh, heaven. It seems that it's it's something that's totally uh, uh, independent. And and one one of the ways that we that, that can help us come to this conclusion is that we know that there are seven heavens but with Jannah we have a hadith that tell us that the degrees of paradise the levels of Jannah are equivalent to the the verses of the Quran so this could be a a clue that they're, they're, they're separate realities Yeah. Now, what is the nature? What is the reality of this uh, Sidratul Muntaha? We don't know. It's it's very uh, it's ambiguous, and I think it's intentionally ambiguous because you know even the Quran says you know the Yaghsha Sidrata Ma Yaghsha that you know whatever you know the 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 tree discloses what it uh, it co- it covers what it covers, so it's very very. Uh, uh, almost cryptic kind of uh, language, and it's it's not something that we 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 understand. It's not something that we can fathom. We just know that it exists, and 
it's uh, it seems just as you mentioned it seems to be a one a focal point uh, of the uh, the mi'raj there was there was an interaction there was an unveiling that took place but beyond that you know we don't know and this is you know at least in the shi'i tradition this is what makes amir al-mu'minin this is what makes imam ali ibn abi talib so important because he he is that he be, he is the gate to that city of knowledge and that city of knowledge is that knowledge that that came from that uh, from that encounter so the way that we kind of get a, a little bit of a glimpse into that that ocean of prophetic knowledge is through this uh, this gate of of Imam Amir al Mu'minin. Just a fun fact. So I, I use it like some really really crude math right now. Just about the the tree, the, the other tree, which is like so wide that a yeah bird can go from the. It takes a bird seven hundred months or years to go around it, or more than that. Yeah. Uh, just kind of going by like an average speed of a bird, that's roughly the distance between the earth to the sun. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a massive tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subhanallah. And yeah, it's it's something that is, is mind-boggling to think. And uh, we hope that, you know, inshallah, we get to witness it and we're among the uh, those who attain salvation but it, it's it really you know when you when you prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know in our salah and you say subhan rabbi al-a'la wa bihamdi it's it's important to remember that everything that we witness is a sliver of this this creation and everything is utterly dependent on Allah at every moment so i mean if if we're in awe of the grandeur of, of creation. I mean, just as Jibreel w- w- was saying to the Prophet that, you know, consider the greatness of the one who created it and consider how foolish we are to defy him. You know, imagine how the audacity that we have to, to disobey him, the sense of entitlement that we have that when I, when I make dua, why doesn't he respond to me? We should be completely humbled that we are even given any consideration, that we are given an audience, that we can speak to him without any restrictions or limitations. You know, that that's what I think about when I when I go through these these traditions and I read about the immensity of of Sama'ud Dunya and the Samawat and Paradise and it's it's very humbling. 